Northeast of Madagascar in the Mozambican Canal, the Reunionese Expedition 2004 sets foot upon the Glorious Islands Archipelago, one of the remote islands that are French-owned territories in the Indian Ocean. Just several short hops from the principal island on the extreme edge of the coral reef emerges Lys Island, a tiny coral islet. Mathieu Lecour, a research scientist at the ECOMAR laboratories of the University of La Réunion, returns to the area one year after his last mission, accompanied by Jessica Kozjadinovic, doctor in the first year of her thesis, and Elizabeth Robert, degree student reading marine ecology. One must be quick, as the stay on the island is limited to five days, and a heavy schedule awaits the three research scientists. Early morning on lease and the activity has been in full swing for a long time now. Mathieu starts his day by observing the larger of the two colonies of birds. The island of Lys is a tiny isle measuring 11 hectares and lies 10 kilometres off the north coast of Grand Glorieuse. It provides shelter for two colonies of sooty terns. This huge colony here numbers around 200,000 couples. It is perched on a rather homogeneous substratum of very compressed guano. In a short while, we shall see a small colony numbering 60,000 couples, which is on a much rockier substratum and is also much more exposed to the wind. There is, however, another species of terns which is nested there known as brown noddies. The attraction of the islands such as the Isle of Lys is that they are protected sites, that is that there is no form of commercial or any other activity and no poaching. These sites are really quite remarkable for the preservation of a colony of seabirds like this one. The Fuligineurs tern are the most common species of seabird to be found in the intertropical zone. They are, throughout the whole of the Western Indian Ocean, more than 6 million pairs, weighing 180 grams and therefore very light, these birds have a high-flying, dynamic style of flight. They feed upon calamar and small fish. Often associated with shoals of tuna, fishing boats know the tern's habits very well. When they are spotted fishing at the ocean's surface, the shoals of tuna are certain to be nearby. It then suffices to trawl the nets in amongst them, and the resulting catch is often very good. During the reproductory phase, the adults start to parade for a duration of two months above the nesting sites before settling to mate. Eggs are then laid, followed by an incubation period of 28 days. And finally, the chicks are reared for a further two months. Both parents participate in each of the phases. They make repeated return trips out to sea in order to feed themselves and their young. Black in colour, the young stay within the colony where they learn to fly. They then follow the parents out to sea and learn to fish until they are completely independent. It is then time to leave this island which, completely deserted, changes its physiognomy. The reproduction cycle begins again in five to six months time. Terns are very sensitive to predators. The terns are usually found in environments which are completely free of natural predators. However, history has revealed that there have been accidental introductions of predators being rats in this instance. Last year, in May 2003, the island was purged to exterminate the rats. One of the objectives of the mission in 2004 is to assess the success of the rat extermination operation. Since our arrival this year, we have done a lot of trapping all over the island, with no rats having been found as of yet. It would seem that the operation has been a success. 
We are undertaking studies on these colonies of terns, studies of biology and ecology, and also population genetics. We have taken blood samples especially to compare the DNA of the different populations between Europa, Juan de Nova, the Glorias, and the Seychelles to determine if these different populations are in contact with one another or else if they operate in closed circles in an isolated regime. This is an important step to understand how the general population of terns operates in the Indian Ocean. As well as this tiny islet being completely overrun with birds, other animal species live here too. Sea turtles, although much preferring the immense white sandy beaches of the glorious islands, sometimes come here to lay their eggs. This morning at dawn the Ecomar team witnessed the rare sight of an emergence of turtle young. For these baby turtles it is indeed a race for their lives, as many will not survive infancy. The night of laying rat traps did not give great satisfaction to Mathieu, Jessica and Elizabeth. They are using this morning to gather new samples, en route for the smaller of the colonies to the west of the island. They make progress in the midst of fossilised coral, adopted by the Fuligineuse tern and the Noddis as their breeding grounds. Even though the laying period is over, the ground is still strewn with eggs and late hatching chicks, so one must be careful as not to crush them underfoot. The aim is to catch as many birds as possible, ring them and then take blood samples. The data taken on site will be analysed later. I'm just going to take a measurement here. OK, so it's the NB. I don't know how far you've got. The rings enable us to identify each bird with a number, thus avoiding touching the same bird twice. To estimate its age, we measure its wing and its beak. Then it is placed in a small bag and weighed. This way we can estimate its body condition, which indicates the activity of its parents in finding food and, therefore, indirectly the quantity of food in the sea. The seabirds are therefore excellent bioindicators for the tropical ocean environment. That one is an adult tern. We're going to put a band on it as well for the same reason as for the young ones. We're going to measure it as well, its wings, beak, weight and tarsus. This time, we're doing it to compare adult birds from different populations in the Indian Ocean and see if these populations keep themselves to themselves and away from one another. It's an important step to see how this species actually operates in the Indian Ocean. We're also going to take a blood sample. This will be used for genetical analyses and then to find the right dose of chemical tracing elements in the environment, which are stable isotopes and heavy metals. We're going to take some feathers off its stomach and feathers from its remix because the chemical tracing elements, being the isotopes and the heavy metals, become ingrained in their feathers during their growth. They also provide us with clues as to the environment where the bird was found when it molted and when it grew its feathers. L'oiseau, au moment où il a où il a mué, où il a fabriqué ses plumes là. Molting occurs in a very progressive way. It is probable that the stomach feathers and those of the wing are conceived at different moments and therefore in different ocean environments. These very mobile birds fly over vast zones stretching from Australia to Lis Island in the Western Indian Ocean. The samples of blood and feather taken from the adults enables us to obtain isotopic data. A transversal analysis of these measurements taken from several species of large predatory birds such as the Fuligineurs will enable us to structure the whole food chain from the Mozambique Canal to better understand the functioning of this whole ocean zone.
mission to the archipelago has finished. Laden with numerous stomach, blood and feather samples, plus birds found dead in situ, the group returns to Reunion Island, where long and fastidious analysis awaits the three ECOMAR research scientists. Jessica has centred her research thesis on the study of heavy metals. She will be able to complete her analysis work in the marine ecology labs. These are the phylogenies terns that we collected, which died on Lease Island and the Glorious Islands. We're going to extract a number of organs in order to study the metals and isotropes. The metals are generally introduced into the animal via the prey that it has ingested through the food chain. These metals will be absorbed in the bloodstream and then distributed to all the bird's organs. Knowing that certain organs will accumulate more of the different metals than others, we call these the targeted organs. For example, the kidney is very important because it accumulates a far greater number of these metals, notably cadmium. As for the liver, it accumulates the other metals we generally analyse. The birds that we picked up dead in situ will enable us to pinpoint even further our analysis, which is based upon the makeup of blood and feathers, taking into account the concentrations accumulated in the internal organs, as I say, the kidney, the liver and the stomach muscles. Mathieu, as well, just back, has taken up residence in his lab. He is being helped in his work by Sébastien Jacquemet and some of the other students. First of all, we have to weigh the contents of the stomach and then we sort the different elements, which is what he's doing right now by separating the fish, the calamars and even any crustaceans that might possibly be there into different lots. Then we proceed to weigh each element and try to identify each item of prey and reconstruct its biomass by taking biometrical measurements on each item of prey, at least the ones that are in reasonable condition. Consequently, there is a lot of analysis work to be carried out. Over here, we're finishing up what we brought back from the Glorias in 2004. We did the mission to the Glorias 2003 not so long ago, and there are other islands that still have to be done. The objective will be to compare the ecological food chain of this predator, which is found in profusion in certain environments, and to try and have a better understanding of the link which exists between the oceanic environment and the dietary habits, in as much as can be measured through this kind of method. We have already been able to observe in these three islands that reproduction strategies, and in particular the reproduction seasons, are very different. Yet these reproduction seasons are necessarily driven by the food chain and the oceanic environment. Thus we are hoping that through this research, which shall be finished in a few months' time, to have a better understanding of the relationship between the oceanic environment and this marine predator. Lys Island finds once more its daily routine. The remote islands of the Indian Ocean must remain sanctuaries to wildlife. The rare privileged research scientists such as Mathieu to be authorised to visit these sites in order to study their evolution permits one to foresee, to measure and to react against the consequences, often disastrous, of human activity.